everybody and thanks very much to Paul Tully in particular for inviting me to speak here. It's a great privilege to have such an audience uh, of leaders of our sector um, to speak to. I want to talk about um, what I think is an extremely serious set of matters this morning, but I'm going to take a big risk and start with a joke. I've never done stand-up comedy, but uh, here goes. There's a builder, an FE lecturer, an FE manager, and a policy maker. And they are all arguing about who has the oldest profession. The builder says, well, at the dawn of, of humankind, um, you know, we were only able to get where we are today because people decided to settle and build communities, build houses, build farms, and so on. So building must be the oldest profession. The FE lecturer says, Oh, well, you see, anybody could have thrown up an old shack, but it was only through people like ourselves distilling the knowledge and skills that were required to develop this, to create an industry that could really last and endure. So we must be the oldest profession um, because we create the professionals. The FE manager says, yes, but in the Bible it says that God created order out of chaos at the start of the world. And it takes a manager's knowledge and skills to do that. And the policymaker says, ah, but who created the chaos in the first place? <laughs> so I'm going to return to that, to that later. Um, but I want to get on with the serious uh, matters in hand. As Lynn said, um, really, my, my first job, my first proper job in academia after finally finding myself back in it after a very long sojourn elsewhere um, and, and having done my uh, doctorate. Uh, my first postdoc job was at Leeds University with some of you will remember Phil Hodkinson, um, Martin Bloomer, who was at Exeter at the time, great champions, Dennis Gleeson uh, and David James, great champions of this sector in the field of educational research and policy. And really from that moment onwards, my research has become more and more focused on the way in which um, the values of what we do have come under challenge. Um, I want to begin by looking at a few quotes from a colleague of mine in France, a guy called Christophe de Jour, um, who's been studying very intensively uh, what happens in public services as the sort of new managerialism, as we've come to call it, and in particular, um, the, the intensification of that uh, with economic uh, recession, how, how that has impacted both on managers and on frontline practitioners in a number of, uh, in a number of public services. So... Dujour talks, uh, really what he helps us to do is to set the day-to-day -day practices that we're involved with in a much wider context. So he talks about the way that the conditions created in the new restructured work organisation place workers in an extremely painful psychological situation, one which throws them out of kilter with values of high quality work, their sense of responsibility and their professional ethics. He then goes on to talk about the way in which certain crises in some of these industries, um, he's looked in particular at sort of serious accidents that have happened in the chemical industry, the, uh, the, 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 the fuel industry, the energy industry and the railway industry, um, have arisen out of this tension between managing an industry and actually taking account of what is happening at the, uh, at the chalk face, coal face, on the railway lines themselves. And he found that um, he was asked by, in, in a number of instances where such you know, disasters or near disasters had happened, he was asked by the French government to investigate what had gone wrong. And he found that by talking to people at the front line, there were a whole number of issues where they had been encouraged to cut corners, do things that threw them out of kilter with their professional values. And that when he went and fed this back to managers, he was confronted by denial and what he calls institutional lying. And he says that these obstacles to revealing the truth have always been present in the workplace. 
but the manipulation of threat to silence opposing views and impose official descriptions of work has become incomparably greater over the last 20 years. The rationality that such managers invoke, he says, is of course economic reasoning, but we shall also see that this almost always insinuates itself into other considerations related to social rationality by virtue of principles which are highly dubious on a moral and practical level. What that takes us to is a situation where we are facing, I think, uh, the threat of a loss of moral compass in the face of an economistic culture which treats clients, patients or students simply in terms of outcomes, which privileges the measurable and tickable, and which operates in denial of the all too real consequences for students and practitioners. Now I'm absolutely certain that the people sat in front of me in this room, yourselves, in a sense I'm preaching to the converted. I'm sure that people who've come to a conference like this are people who are well aware of these challenges and are battling them day to day and trying to support their staff in the face of them. But I think that we need to, in doing that, we need to look across the sector and we need to think about raising the issue that value um, is increasingly being counterposed to values. So when I talk about value, I'm using it in a specific sense. I'm talking about an economistic purpose, i.e. one that's so highly instrumental that it's not really about economics because we know how important our sector is to the economy per se, but an economistic purpose. We're talking about a focus on profitability, on efficiency, on what is privatised or privatisable on restricting access to our services and we can already look across the FE sector, the adult education sector and see how much restriction there is now for many of the most needy uh, 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 learners who we would have been able to welcome in the past. Um, and a focus here on a technical, technical term, the exchange value, in a sense that notion that, that one can know the price of everything but the value of nothing. And that that becomes increasingly counterposed to what I would call values with an S on the end, to the social purpose of further education. It's professional, pedagogical values. Not its efficiency, but its effectiveness. The notion of public service and a dedication to public service, to universal access, and to the use value of what we do. I, what difference does it make in the world today? Now, this book came out about um, seven years ago now. Um, it was based on the uh, project Transforming Learning Cultures in Further Education, which I had the privilege to work on in, in that first job, um, along with the likes of Martin Bloomer, Phil Hodkinson, Dennis Gleeson, and David James. Um, it was part of a massive programme of research, uh, funded by Hefke um, and administered through the Economic and Social Research Council. So in a sense I had the great good fortune to end up working on a project which really was the, the, the creme de la creme, if you like. Um, the project ran over a period of uh, five and a half years. It's the largest ever research project that's taken place. Uh, in, in further education. It was funded to the tune of a million pounds, uh, largely, as I said, through Hefke and the Research Council, but also through a major contribution towards that in kind from the colleges that we worked with. A fundamental principle of this project was that we wanted to research in and with colleges and their staff, not on them. That was absolutely fundamental to the design of the project. And so we had 24 FE tutors and uh, managers involved as researchers in, in that project. It was committed, as the whole program was, to improving teaching and learning. Um, and it, it strove to retain a focus on pedagogical values. But it has created the most rigorous evidence base that we have in our sector so far um, for learning about uh, what, what can go on and what we need to do about that. And I think what was important about that focus on pedagogical values was it focused on processes rather than just outcomes. Going back to perhaps an old-fashioned notion um, that, that's where, that that's where our eyes need to be looking uh, at. And in the workshop that I'm going to be doing this afternoon, 
I want to look at um, how we drew out of that evidence base some principles uh, of flexible procedure uh, for allowing people um, to, uh, to really develop and enhance teaching and learning in the sector, much of which resonates with what the previous speakers have already said. Now, um, one of the uh, important findings um, in our project, we had four years of action research with tutors introducing interventions to improve teaching and learning in their learning sites. Almost all of those were overturned by policy changes during the course of the project. Deeply committed staff became very disillusioned. 16 of those 24 teacher researchers had quit or, or, or were on the verge of quitting by the end of the project, uh, quitting the sector. Um, and the rich and rigorous research that we produced was largely ignored by uh, policy makers. But I think it remains a rich store of evidence with great relevance still today. Just want to point very briefly to some recent research by a colleague of mine, Gillian Bailey, who's done a longitudinal study of pre-service trainees uh, for FE teaching. Um, she's been looking in detail at, at sort of two subsequent cohorts, um, quite a large a uh, number of students for a qualitative uh, study in their experiences of placements and first jobs in further education. Their story is absolutely resounded with detailed scripting of teachers and their practice that goes beyond the simple uh, 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 level of prescription to very detailed scripting. The time pressures that Tony mentioned being um, very difficult for them to manage and a rhetoric of learner-centeredness actually cloaking a consumerist culture which those students believe was not in learners' interests at all. So her project really demonstrates the intensification of this economic rationality, the privileging of value over the last few years, and the erosion of the values of good education. So I would argue that we're continuing to have to fight a battle against this loss of moral compass. I think that this question of whether value or values are going to be privileged in further education has to be seen as a leadership challenge. How can we affirm the moral compass of what we do? How can we ensure that pedagogical values take precedence over economistic value? How can we say no to the policies which privilege value over values? My colleague, Professor Julia Everts, is probably the most influential international scholar on, uh, on professions um, in the world today. She argues that the litmus test of a, profession, of, of a profession is its capacity to say no to policy makers, to government. This is a crucial debate for FE leaders. How will you, to go back to my initial joke, how will you create an order based on values? How will you spread that and maintain it where you are doing that already? Out of a chaos, an increasing chaos based on value. As I said, I feel, I'm sure, I'm preaching to the converted at a conference like this. But I guess the final question I pose is how will you, as leaders, lead the managers who are not here today? 